Yeah, 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 yeah. My lords, it's a privilege to take my place on these distinguished and tranquil benches after 33 testing years before the mast in another place. I thank my noble friend for her kind references to me. I thank the noble Lord, Lord Richards, for his explicit and implied references to me. And I thank the noble Lord, Lord Jenkins, for parts of his speech very much. <laughs> Mine is a somewhat delicate position, because I calculate that I was responsible as Prime Minister for proposing the elevation to this House of some 214 <laughs> of its present members. <laughs> that must surely be considerably more than most of my predecessors. And my father did not know Lloyd George. <laughs> As Prime Minister, I made a point of following your Lordship's debates and the reports of your select committees and found them invaluable for the wealth of experience and worldliness which they contained. I have to confess that your voting record occasionally gave rise to other and more violent emotions, <laughs> particularly when the votes were on matters of finance, and my frustration was too often and unfairly visited on the thankfully broad shoulders of my noble friends, the Viscount Whitelaw and Lord Denham. <laughs> I am sure the view from here will look quite different. I ask for your forbearance for speaking so soon after my arrival in your Lordship's house, rather than allowing a decent interval to elapse. But Britain's presidency of the community comes round only once every six years, <coughs> and in future it may be longer than that. Notorious as I am for patience and restraint, I can hardly wait that long. <laughs> I find, as the noble Lord Lord Richard said, that the late Earl Stockton managed 33 minutes, during which he was not exactly complimentary about the then government's economic policies or its handling of the miners' strike. So, speeches are not always non-controversial. The noble Lord Lord Wilson, for his part, spent 20 minutes trampling politely on the government's record in training and higher education. So I take heart that, in fact, the non-controversial tradition may be sometimes honoured in the breach. But, of course, what is controversial to one may be music to the ears of another. And without differences of view, there would be no debate. And if Parliament lost its powers to another body, there would be little point in debate. I notice from the speeches that have already been given that one point has emerged very forcibly. Bearing in mind that all three parties are of the same view about ratifying Maastricht, the electorate has had no way during the general election of expressing its view because it had, in fact, no choice. Britain has usually set itself rather modest and limited objectives during its turn at holding the presidency of the EC. True, our last presidency launched a single market, and in view of some of the comments about the Single European Act, which I heard in this House on Tuesday, I'll have something to say about that later, and my noble friend has already referred to it. But generally, we've concentrated on organising the community's business efficiently, and drawing precise conclusions from wordy and chaotic debates. That was necessary, but will certainly not be enough this time. Rarely, if ever, has the community had a greater number of important issues demanding its attention than now. Most of them were mentioned by my noble friend, the Minister of State, and I'll not repeat the list which he gave so ably, but start with what is on everyone's lips, the most pressing question, what to do about Maastricht after the Danish referendum. Many people who travel through Europe, as I have done in recent months, are struck by the very sharp change in attitudes towards the European community brought about by the Maastricht Treaty. 
Skepticism, justifiable skepticism, <coughs> is on the increase. People feel that their governments have gone ahead too fast, so that now the gap between government and people is too wide. Perhaps that's not surprising when in the modern political world, European ministers spend so much time in each other's company. They get out of touch with the people and too much in touch with themselves. The particular concerns are different in each country, but the basic misgivings are mostly the same. People feel that too many of the powers and rights, which have been theirs for decades, and in some cases for centuries, are being given away to the center in Brussels. And we had echoes of that in the speech of the noble Lord, Lord Jenkins. And I find it very difficult to understand that two arguments are being run alongside and they are mutually exclusive. So there's far too much centralization going on, far too much bureaucracy going on. We don't like it, but nevertheless, we're going to ratify the Maastricht Treaty. These things just don't, to me, add up. There also is among people a good healthy understanding that bigger is not always better and that variety is more desirable than conformity. The Danish no to Maastricht is just one sign of those things. The recent opinion poll shows that seven out of ten Germans do not want a single currency. And seven out of ten do not want either to surrender significant powers in order to have a common foreign policy. People understand that Maastricht is more, much more, than just a technical adjustment to the Treaty of Rome. The people of Denmark saw that when they received their copies, free copies, I would stress, of the Maastricht text. One figure illustrates better than anything else the scale of the extra <coughs> intrusion into the authority of national parliaments and governments and into people's lives, which Maastricht would bring about. The Treaty of Rome provides for the Commission to have the sole right of initiative in 11 areas of policy. In Maastricht, that reaches 20, to which one has to add at least five other areas of cooperation where the Commission is fully involved, monetary, judicial and immigration matters, as well as foreign policy and defence. No wonder people feel they have a right to be consulted about such a major change in the way in which they are governed, especially in the light of Monsieur Delors' notorious statement to the European Parliament that 80% of the decisions taken on economic and social matters will soon be taken by the European community rather than by national governments and parliaments. It's being alleged that no less substantial powers were conceded to the community in the single European Act. I hope your Lordships will not accept that assertion, but will look at the debates in another place in 1986 about the Single European Act, and will look in particular at the assurances given at that time by the then Foreign Secretary, now my noble friend Lord Howe, and by my noble friend, the Minister of State, who opened the debate. Qualified majority <coughs> voting is, of course, in the Treaty of Rome itself, my noble friend, the then Foreign Secretary, made clear that in the single European Act, qualified majority voting replaced unanimity only for the measures which were major components of the construction of the common market. He said explicitly that their scope was not indefinite. He pointed out that some subjects were of such importance to the national policies of individual member states that they should remain subject to unanimity voting namely tax measures, measures relating to the free movement of individuals, and measures affecting the rights and interests of employed persons. He recognized that there would be some people who would be anxious that in extending qualified majority voting to promote the achievement of an internal market, we might diminish the essential protection of our national interest. And he concluded, I would not accept that. And he gave his reasons for doing so. My lords, the suggestion that there is any comparison between the powers transferred to the community in the single European Act and in Maastricht is, I believe, misplaced. 
Bearing in mind the burning and urgent problems of the moment, one also has to ask, what is the relevance of the Maastricht Treaty to these? What, for example, does it do for fragile democracy in Eastern and Central Europe? It makes it more difficult for those countries to join. And last week's European Council refused even to open negotiations with the much more advanced EFTA countries. The attitude is that we have to form our own tight little huddle before we can even contemplate admitting others. What does Maastricht do to help lift Europe out of recession? It shackles and burdens our economies with the extra restrictions and intrusive regulations imposed by the Social Charter. And we found out last week that the Commission are still trying to do that, despite our having opted out of that chapter of the Maastricht Treaty, thanks to the Prime Minister. Unfortunately, the Commission have not yet had their action challenged in the European Court. The Government have indicated that it may do so, and I hope that it will. We shall then know where we stand on this matter. The reason for all this, my lords, is that Maastricht does not tackle today's problems. There's been a hint of that in the other speeches. The world has changed dramatically in the last two years. And the community must adapt to that or it will lose its purpose and lose its support. The result of the Danish referendum is an opportunity to think again. But there's regrettably little sign from last week's European Council that the community as a whole is ready to do that. Certainly, it will take more than a self-denying ordinance on the part of the Commission <coughs> or a promise to give back some of the powers which they have arrogated. Their record of evading the unanimity provisions of the single European Act deprives them of the good faith we should otherwise have accorded them. I'm very glad that the Foreign Secretary has said, the noble lady repeated it today, that Denmark can't be coerced and can't be excluded. If that were to happen, the community would be breaking its own laws, which state with absolute clarity that Maastricht has to be ratified by all 12 member states if it is to come into force. If we allow that to be overridden in Denmark's case, each and every one of us will become vulnerable to being coerced or excluded on some other issue or on some other occasion in the future. We are an association of free peoples, free to take a democratic vote. Denmark has exercised that freedom. Is it now to be suggested she did something wrong or somehow she must change her mind? After all, our Prime Minister fortunately exercised our right to be different and not to be governed by the social chapter and not to be governed automatically by a single currency, although we agree the idea. We have done it. We are perhaps the oldest democracy and the freest. It's not for us to criticise others. And if ever it is suggested that each peoples cannot say no without an attempt at duress, that is a very, very serious matter for the community and one would need to revise one's views of whether it is a community now of free peoples. Searching for a definition of subsidiarity is not a satisfactory way forward either, if only because it is based on the notion that it is the community which has the power, which it then parcels out <coughs> to member states. The true situation should be the reverse. It should be the member states who exercise all powers, except those which are specifically and legally granted to the Commission. My own immediate, albeit limited, suggestion at this stage is that the Government should propose a formal and binding restatement of the Luxembourg Compromise. It's not a lot, but it's a little. Your Lordships will recall that this provides that if any member state considers that its vital national interest is at stake, then no vote will be taken and it can be postponed until agreement is reached between all parties. I believe that would go some way to restore people's confidence in the community. And hard as it will be to get agreement, I hope that the government will consider it because technically the Luxem compromise, Luxembourg compromise is still there. In practice, there is some doubt 
as to whether and how effectively it can be used. I make one further plea before concluding this particular, particular section of my speech, a plea that the Maastricht Treaty be not discussed in terms of personalities. It is too important for that, but in terms of the issues involved. The government have a most difficult and complex task on their hands with this whole issue during the British presidency, and I'm sure they will acquit themselves with distinction in dealing with it and uphold the freedoms of our respective peoples. I will deal with the other issues which will affect our presidency more briefly. Enlargement, my honourable friend, my, my noble friend has already dealt with it. It's as urgent for the presidency as the Maastricht Agreement is the issue of enlargement of the community. And it is depressing that despite our government's best efforts in Lisbon, other member states have refused to embark on the necessary formal negotiations. I sometimes wonder whether other governments fully comprehend the scale and the consequences of the bloodless victory over communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. In a space of two years, it has become a different world. Not the end of history, as some foretold, but the return of history. First, Yalta was swept away, and a very good thing too. Now Versailles is following it some of us do not find surprising. The real urgency now is to stretch out a hand to the countries of Eastern and Central Europe. We were not able to free them from communist tyranny. When they escaped, it was by their own efforts. Now we have a pressing moral obligation to sustain democracy and free economies, just as we did in earlier times for Greece and Spain and Portugal by bringing these East European countries into the community as soon as possible, even though it would require a very long transition period. This is not just in their interests, but also ours. We don't want the community to be in the position of Dr. Johnson. Your Lordships will recall his reply to Lord Chesterfield's congratulations after he had completed his dictionary in the cold and poverty of his garret. Is not, he said, a patron, my lord, one who looks with unconcern on a man struggling for life in the water, and when he has reached ground, encumbers him with help. <laughs> I recognize that we have association agreements with East European countries, but that's not enough for the assurance they need. The widening of Europe to include the post-communist countries is, I believe, of much, much more importance than the early admission of other countries. And if the European community does not respond more rapidly to the needs of Eastern Europe, the problem will still arrive on our doorstep because many people from those countries will, many peoples from those countries will join the community even if their governments can't. They will vote with their feet and arrive in even larger numbers. And I hope the government undaunted by last week's setback in Lisbon, Lisbon on enlargement, will return to the charge. My Lords, there are many other pressing issues for the Presidency, but I shall touch on them only very briefly. Finance, there's still plenty of room under the present own resources ceiling to do the things which are most urgent. And we heard at question time that all the money is apparently not being well used and could be put to better use. Yeah, yeah. I commend the government for their robust refusal to contemplate additional funds for the community. There will no doubt be attempts to reopen the issue of the British rebate. I had some great budget battles in my day. The noble lord was there and I think witnessed, the noble lord Lord Jenkins was there and witnessed some of them and understood the point I was trying to make. I always found that the most effective weapon was no. <laughs> or sometimes, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm glad that this continues to be the policy, even if it is more sweetly expressed. <laughs> Britain with the Commission was the main driving force behind the launch of the single market, and I pay particular tribute, joining my noble friend, 
to the work which my noble friend Lord Cofield did to bring about free trade within Europe, one of the original objectives of the old EEC. And I hope we shall use our presidency for a final drive towards its completion. This is especially important, as my noble friend says, especially important for our service industries. They're one of our particular strengths, yet their opportunities have been greatly constrained by protectionism in other member states often masquerading under the false flag of restrictions required for regulatory purposes. The remaining obstacles should be removed quickly and no new bureaucracies created. Indeed, in a sensible world, we would never have gone ahead with a new treaty at all until the single market had been first completed and was in operation. My Lords, at long last, the community is realizing that statements, declarations, and even sanctions are not a strong enough response to the terrible slaughter in what was part of Yugoslavia. Not in some remote country, but a little more than a two-hour flight from London and in the heart of Europe. Some of us have been warning for a time that the use of force might become necessary. And I'm sure that one of the first actions of our presidency will be to help organize sustained relief <coughs> supplies for Sarajevo and for other places where people have been brutally attacked and their cities devastated. And if attempts are made to interfere with those supplies, I believe we should be ready to use the air power available to NATO in the area to deal with them. After all, we gave the Kurds air power. And there's no reason why we shouldn't have given it earlier to some of those people in Yugoslavia. It's sad that once again, the lead had to come from America, in particular from James Baker, rather than the European community. Although we applaud President Mitterrand for his visit to Sarajevo, which raised the morale of those suffering people. The fact is that with a common foreign policy, we would be dependent on the lowest common denominator among the 12, as we all, and we all saw what that meant in the Gulf War. Tyrants are not defeated by the action of the United Nations. They do the resolutions. Not by the action of the community. Tyrants are defeated by the lead of nation states who have sufficient defense to go and to do the necessary tasks. I agree with my noble friend about the GAT, the importance of the GAT negotiations. I recall very well that at the last European Council, which I attended as Prime Minister just over two years ago, despite all my efforts, my fellow heads of government refused even to discuss the negotiations, even though the deadline for the Uruguay round was only three months away. It has in fact been extended twice the matter still not resolved. In the meantime, uh, we have in fact perhaps lost a very great deal of trade which would have helped us during the recession had we come to agreements earlier. My Lords, this debate about the Presidency coincides with one of the great constitutional issues of our time. In such matters, your Lordship's advice carries very great weight and I'm sure that we shall come back to the, Ma to the Maastricht Treaty and hope that we shall debate its implications in full after the recess. It will be obvious to your Lordships by this time that I have never knowingly made an uncontroversial speech in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I hope to be more controversial when we get down to discussing the details. I believe that my noble friend, the Prime Minister, my honourable friend, right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, can have a very great influence on the whole future of the community. I've made my view clear on the Maastricht Treaty. I do not believe that will be resolved during our presidency for the reasons I've indicated, and I think noble lords would know how I would vote. But there are so many other things which are more immediate which I'm certain my, our Prime Minister is the best person to address. I'm sure that he will do that with effectiveness and distinction. And I wish him well 
during Britain's presidency. My Lords, it is a, a very great pleasure for me to, if I may, welcome the noble lady to this house and also to congratulate her on her maiden speech and particularly on getting it over so quickly. <laughs> uh, she, she, she said that uh, she had served for many years before the mast. Um, I thought this afternoon perhaps she was hoisting the Jolly Roger uh, when I heard some of the uh, comments that she had to make, but uh, she was quite, uh, Lord Jenkins, noble Lord, Lord Jenkins was quite right. The, we were all agog to hear how she would handle this speech about which there had been a lot of rumblings. Uh, I suppose um, she must have felt quite at home yesterday when she was introduced uh, and um, found herself surrounded by so many of her former colleagues, those uh, she had promoted, uh, those she had elevated, those she had fired, <laughs> And, of course, we mustn't forget the one who took his bat home. Uh, it, um, it must have made her feel very much at home to see a collection of ghosts that had not been witnessed since Dickens' Christmas Carol. <laughs> <laughs> All waiting to strike. But I want to say in all sincerity to the noble lady that um, her matchless record as Prime Minister, the longest serving record Prime Minister of this century and the experience and the knowledge that she accumulated during that period will be of very great value uh, to your Lordship's House and I am sure we all genuinely welcome uh, this addition to our ranks. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, to be truthful it wasn't um, when I listened to the noble lady it wasn't uh, Dickens, who really came into my mind, it was Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, I, I recall the, very clearly the asperities in another place which used to be flung across the dispatch box from side to side. And when I uh, contrasted that with the dulcet tones which uh, we heard this afternoon from the noble lady, my mind turned to bottom. Bottom, addressing the assembled workers, said, you will recall, I will aggravate my voice and roar you as gently as any sucking dove. <laughs> I will roar you as twere a nightingale. And listening to the noble lady this afternoon, I saw that she had rapidly come to the conclusion that your, your lordships will always concede to persuasion what they will not yield to coercion. <laughs> and in those circumstances, she will have a very considerable influence in this house. Uh, we, I, she will add great vigour and vitality and clarity to our debates. And I must say, I'm looking forward to them, especially on the Maastricht Treaty, with very great interest. And I think most of my honourable friends are. I noticed the Government Chief Whip was looking with intense interest uh, at her, as indeed we all were. Uh, during her speech, I, I'm not sure whether his pleasure at the end of some of these speeches will be as intense as his interest was. But at any rate, we are very glad indeed to have her among her mi our, our midst because it will certainly add to our strength. Um, my Lord, as she said, the um, Denmark was a shock, but in my view, a very necessary shock. In some ways, we seem to be almost sleepwalking into the consequences of what we were doing. And yet it seems to me imperative uh, that we should have a very full debate, not only in this country, where I believe we have debated it more fully than in most other countries, but in the rest of Europe, where I agree with the noble lady, there has been some change of atmosphere and of approach uh, during the last few months. And it is for this reason that I believe the, we must have a most full debate throughout the whole of Europe on what is being done. Because there is no doubt that what is being proposed is probably the most momentous decision that has been put before member countries 
since the actual creation of the community of Europe. And in that sense, we must be clear as to what it is that we are inviting people to do. We must not play down the issue in any way. There must be no division, as the noble lady suggested there might be, between what I might call the political class and the people. I speak as one who believes that, uh, there sh that this treaty should be ratified, uh, despite its faults and despite its, its shortcomings. Uh, but nevertheless, I do not think that we should allow our people or, 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 uh, to, 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 to feel that this is something of small matter uh, which does not really concern them or indeed change their position in the world. It changes it very drastically. It is a continuation of the struggle which has gone on ever since uh, Ernie Bevin, uh, who um, sent me to the first Council of Europe in 1949 uh, and asked me to defeat the Federalists. It is a continuation of the struggle between what we then called the Federalists and the Functionists. And I have no hesitation in saying that in this particular issue, the Federalists have won against the Functionists. I do not say that we are entering a, a federal Europe. That would be wrong. And indeed, the Federalists in Europe, as I have read, are disappointed at to what came out of Maastricht. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this particular area of an economic and monetary union, it cannot be denied, it must be clear, uh, that we are yielding up a portion of national sovereignty that I would not have expected to see. And this issue should be faced. It should be faced and dealt with. And those of us who believe that it is the right way to go should assert this view very strongly and not only assert it, but should go out and convince people that for reasons of reason or two that I will give in the two or three minutes left to me is proper. Uh, for this reason, let me say to the noble lord, the leader of the house, I, I would urge him to tug the prime minister's elbow about, um, about a referendum. The noble lady's got a point here. Um, if, um, if this momentum builds up, and I have a history on referendums, uh, I, I, and, and I have not seen any weakening or destruction of the Constitution because we had a referendum 15 years ago. And if it was felt necessary in order to get a clear opinion from the British people to have a referendum, which I believe would be one, incidentally, that's one of the reasons why I'm very ready to back it as I was last time. Uh, I always believe in backing winners if it's possible. If this were so, then I would certainly suggest that the Prime Minister should perhaps think a little more about what he has said so clearly about not having a referendum. Uh, I, 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 let me state it quite clearly. Parliament, the, 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 bill, the, 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 the bill should be placed before Parliament.